talks about how we can share knowledge without sharing data. Um, first of all, why is that such an important topic? If you would take a look at Google Trends for the last half of decade or so, uh, you will notice that back in around 2005, 6, the big hot word was big data. That's what everybody was talking about. It's going to change the world. And indeed, you see the Google Trends is going to the roof. And then a few years later comes data science. And you get to see a lot of uh, you know, the sexiest job and all these wonderful things about data science. And indeed, it's just skyrocketing right now, even bigger than big data. And then in just a couple of years later, perhaps another trend going on with machine learning, deep learning in particular. Now, why are these three things coming in that particular order? If you think about it, data science is about getting knowledge out of data. And of course, knowledge on its own, unless you can act on it to control something, to monetize it, it's worthless. So if you think about it, first you get a lot of data and says, oh my god, what am I going to do with the data? And then, now we got some knowledge. How are we going to act on it? Indeed, you, you heard the uh, data is the new oil, you know that? Data is an asset. Of course, you have to get it off of the ground. You have to define it. You have to approach That's data science. That's the analysis, right, that goes into it. And of course, if you have data, you have knowledge, you have power. Knowledge is power. So, this is why this is so important. Let's focus on this actionable knowledge from data uh, workflow. How does it work? Um, well, there's two parts. You use your whole data, every data, you train models, and then from that, you can take action. You can think of it as two processes. The first one is the training component. And, you know, at a very high level, it's just a function applied to a whole bunch of inputs. Problem is, this training data, any valuable training data, is private data. So, it's not that nice picture of just a disk with ton of data. This data is confidential if it's from a company. If it has individual data in it, it's private. Okay, so we have a little problem there. Let's look at the second component. That's getting that model that you learned from the data and then act it, using it to make predictions, to act with whatever way you want. It's another function. The prediction is just another process you have to run. But again, the data that on which you are going to act is private. Not only that, but since you spend all this money with building the model, doing machine learning, you actually think about your model and about your process of recommending it as a trade secret. You don't want to have your competitor know why you are recommending this or that or doing this action or this or that. So actually there's two issues here. How do I protect the data used for training, we talked about that before, how to protect the privacy of the folks for whom I'm making the predictions, and finally, how do I protect my own asset, which is the model itself. All right, so it turns out that at least you can think about one way to solve this is to use the privacy preserving technology, the one particular one over here, a little bit about clearer today, uh, throughout this morning session, uh, is multi-party computation, which is sort of, you can think of it as a version of also homomorphic computation. And generally speaking, it says you can compute any function based on inputs to derive knowledge, okay? The interesting part is that you don't have to see these inputs. The only thing that gets revealed is the function you want to compute, nothing else. At least at 60,000 feet, that's what multi-party computation is. And that's very promising because if you go back to the picture I showed you, you can assume hope that all the data used to train the model remains private, but you get the model. Or the data you're going to use in order to do the prediction can remain private. So let me tell you why this is has been very exciting for me personally and also for the collaboration with Red Hat is a few years ago we actually landed on a problem that just cried for multi-party computation, and that was the following. Is there a way to combine payroll information from about 200 or so companies to compute whether men and women are paid the same for the same work? 
gender inequity analysis. Now, how many of you think that companies, big companies, are going to just give their data to the city of Boston to do the analysis? Nobody. This data has compensation, think about executives and so on and so on. So it was nice for the mayor uh, to sign this thing back in 2013, but to get the employers to do this was the problem. And this is where we stepped in. Uh, as a matter of fact, the idea was to have a, a third party do this. And the third party's lawyer said, we're not touching this data. It's a toxic asset. Because if we, if we lose it, we're going to be sued. Right? So it, it's like, you have 200 companies. They have the data sets. They're willing to apply data science to it, whatever you're going to do on it. But the problem is, who's going to hold on to it? Do you trust anybody? This is where we stepped in and multiple computation helped us. I spare you the details, happy to talk about it offline. Um, it's been a wonderful four years. Um, and the result is that for two years in a row, now we're doing uh, the fourth of these, there is an annual report that comes out, talks about not just men and women, but also different uh, racial minorities, different types of jobs. And we, have get, we get a lot more visibility into the issues of gender equity um, by looking at very fine data. So, great. The word goes out that BU and the city of Boston have done this. As a matter of fact, there are, so this technology, recent bills passed by Congress and Senate. Again, happy to talk about that. A good example is something I wrote on an editorial on in the Washington Post. And it's about the, it's a bill called the right to know before you go. What does that mean? Well, if you're going to pay sixty thousand dollars a year to put your kid in college, how do you know that they're going to get a job after they graduate? Wouldn't it be nice if you can get a scorecard for the college? So if you go to history at BU, this is the kind of debt you are going to be in three years out or ten years out. Or if you go to computer science at BU. This is how millions of dollars are going to make a few years later, right? So, wonderful. So, the problem is we don't get these four cards because colleges are very secret and this is private information of students. Anyway, so, great, great success. Four years, I mentioned, has been a nice journey. We got our uh, recognition from the mayor, from Congress, and I, of course, have to acknowledge the folks on the left bottom. These are all the Operators, at least a subset of them. Graduate students, you're going to hear uh, later today from uh, a couple of them. So, I was told that not everybody here knows what multi party competition is. I'll give you a quick hint. So, let, imagine that um, this is the city of Boston on the bottom there, and they ask the question to these two individuals saying, hey, I'd love to know what's the difference between the money you make. Simple question. Can you just give me your salaries? First, the two nice guys that says, wait a second, I'm happy to help you, but there is no way on hell I'm going to tell you what my salary is. So you understand, they agree to compute the difference in their salary, but they're not willing to give their salaries away. The difference could be $2,000, but it could be that each of them is making, you know, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, right? So how do you do that? And here is me showing up in the corner saying, hey, I have a solution for you. And here's the solution. We're going to get two independent servers that we know are, you know, will be trusted not with the data, because nobody can be trusted with the data, but the fact that they're not going to talk to one another. They're just not collude. You know the whole collusion, the Russian collusion? So, no collusion. Okay. Great. What are we going to do with these servers? The first individual, let's say their salary is nine, for technical reasons, we're going to use modular arithmetic, which means you know what modular arithmetic is. So let's imagine that my salary, which is secret, is nine. Rather than telling either of them my salary, I'm going to give them two random numbers, They're totally random. When you add them, they give you nine. So 10 plus 11 is 21. If you think about a clock, that's nine. Okay? Of course, you never give this nine to anybody, so just stick it out. This is what we have. So clearly, neither BU nor MIT know anything about those and salary. All well, they got is two random numbers. Everybody sees that? Sure, and then the lady is going to do the same. 
4 plus 5 plus 3 is 7. Again, number 7 was never revealed to anybody. We just got two random numbers. And now I'm going to pop up my head again and say, hey, each one of you got a piece. It's a random piece from the original number. Why don't you subtract them? So everyone on that own subtract, subtracts one from the other. Again, the result is a random number. The original name is random. And of course, if you do that with the math and add up what you just subtracted and give that to the city of Boston, they get the number two, which lo and behold is nothing other than nine minus seven. So this is just to illustrate that you can, through interesting communication and passing messages and doing some math, arithmetic, um, you can compute functions without seeing or revealing the inputs to the function. So that's what quantum parts of computation is. You can go play this with your kids, they will love you for it. Well, okay, nice, we did this. Maybe B was the only one in the universe doing this. Not true, there's lots of others who are doing this. Here today you will hear from Kurt in this session about uh, similar work. Uh, and then other companies out there, as a matter of fact, Google has that, and we'll hear more about this in a second. So this looks like the end of the story, and we should just leave. Well, there's a question about performance. You know, as you notice, instead of just doing a subtraction, they did a lot of work to figure out the difference. So maybe it's expensive. It is, especially if you're going to do things like multiplication, a little harder to condition. But it turns out that if you look at this graph, this is sort of think about it as a benchmark to see how fast multi-party computation can be. And over the years, going back to 2011, by the way, the y-axis here is a logarithmic. So this is huge improvements in how fast we can do this particular operation. You can see that we are getting close to computing with secrets than just doing it in the clear. So the clear means you just review your secrets have something to compute for. Uh, so the research at you will be working on this, obviously, way more than just one application. We have other work. Uh, happy to talk about that. In general, what we're working on are to develop new multi-party computation primitives. Um, for example, to do things like ride sharing. Can we do ride sharing without the passenger's information ever being leaked? Can we do... Uh, <coughs> my student, Kinan, uh, will be talking about this later today. Um, in addition, we also work on various libraries and to deploy multi-party computation as a service. In, in my opinion, technology like this it has to be integrated in the software stacks so that you don't require somebody who is an expert in encryption to use it. Um, okay, so that was the good news. Here's the bad news. If you have a machine learning model, so we do this wonderful thing, that we have a model can apply. The problem is data about the, the, the customers, let's say, or the input data, ends up being stored in your machine learning model, which means if you keep using it, you eventually can reconstruct the data used for training. So after we do all of this, it turns out that, hey, if I just keep querying the model, I can figure out the inputs to it anyway. That's a problem. As a matter of fact, there are other problems. The adversaries can themselves, in, if one of the, the data sets that you use to change your model is controlled by an adversary, then they can basically find the equivalent of the Trojan horse. They add information to your data so that when you query the model later, you can, um, you can uh, basically leak or see the information you want. Finally, it turns out that these learned models that we think of as three secrets, can themselves be leaked, again, through just continuous use of this. So how we don't solve that, there's another technology. It's called differential privacy. So differential privacy is a very interesting technology. Again, uh, since I'm up here and I'm from the EU, one of the co-authors of the original work on differential privacy is a faculty at Boston University, Adam Smith. Unfortunately, he's on the West Coast. We actually invited him to be in this session. He couldn't make it, so I'm sure I'll get a check for next year. So, in differential privacy, you have the original data, which is on the left, and the question is, if my information, let's say I'm the green person, the bottom there, if I don't want my information to be leaked, 
then here is an interesting way to think about this. If this adversary on the right cannot tell the difference between whatever analytic you compute, whether or not I am inside the database, then I'm safe. Think about this way. My genetic information is inside some database. I should be worried about leakage of that if there is a way for anybody that uses this database to do cancer treatment, whatever it is, to tell whether I am in the data or not in the data. If you do the computation with my data in, and you come up with the result, and then you take my data out of it, and you do the same thing again, if you cannot tell the difference, then I'm safe, because they cannot tell I was dead. So this is the premise of differential privacy. So effectively, it's really about hiding the individual data in a large collection. And by the way, this is mature enough that the Census Bureau is using this to allow social scientists to do their research on census data starting in 2020. And you can see there's some coverage. Um, of course, the social scientists want to get the data as it is. So they are saying, oh, wait a second, we're adding randomness. It's not going to be as accurate as it could be. Not exactly right, but um, it, it's a, so this is basically a, a technology that I think is, is available and we can use it. So why am I mentioning it? Because this technology can be a very good building block into this picture I showed you before. Specifically, here is what we do. We can use this technology to hide the private data that we use for training. How do we do that? Think about it. Let's say you have a thousand uh, records in the original data. Imagine if I take one record out and produce a data set that one of these red things on top. There's actually many, 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 many different combinations of records that I can do. So think about it as sampling the original data and then letting that be the input to your machine learning. So I'll spare the details, happy to talk about this offline. The bottom line is I can use this approach we just saw as a way to uh, train the model. So this way, because I'm using differential privacy, I can, even if you are leaking information through the model, the information you're leaking is not really about the individual, since you hit that and be behind differential privacy. And then the hope is that maybe you can use multi-party competition, at least for some other parts of the process. So with that, um, I would like just to conclude these notes. This is supposed to be the way to start this session. And what I want to say is that um, data science and machine learning are about making it easy to infer hidden information from large data sets. That's what extracting knowledge from data is. Interestingly, machine privacy tools is exactly the opposite. Privacy tools is about making it hard for adversaries to uncover confidential information from large data sets. So you should think about privacy and about machine learning as literally opposing one another. One is about, I want to find out about you from some signal I get. And the other one is, I want to hide what you do. They literally are trying to do uh, opposites. Oddly enough, they can work together in a very interesting way to enable that, um, that workflow. Uh, the last bullet there is what I believe should be interesting to many of us, which is how do we make these tools integrated into practical, usable, accessible software stacks? Because some of the technology, some of the techniques so are difficult. You cannot expect every programmer to understand that. So what are the best practices in integrating all these technologies in our software stacks? So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and I can take some questions.